Uh, today, I want to talk about this idea of Gandhi 3.0. You can tell I'm from the Silicon Valley. We like to put version numbers on everything. <laughs> we don't spare Gandhi either. Um, <laughs> really, it's this idea of combining um, our modern day tools of organizing with the ancient values that Gandhi embodied. But first, I want to start with a story of a smile card. This, I, this, is, uh, this actually started in, at the dining table of my cousin's house in Chicago. We were having a chat, and the conversation veered towards pranks, college pranks. So why do these kids do all these amazing, elaborate college pranks? We started talking about the different motivations. Well, it's fun, definitely fun. It's also challenging, it's also creative, it's also collaborative. And we went down this whole list. Then I asked my cousin, yes, but it's also destructive. Can we flip it? Can we make it constructive? Can we take the same incentives and do something concrete just to make someone's day? My cousin got a little excited. He's like, oh, like kindness pranks. Like just do something nice for somebody and just disappear. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. He said, oh, we could even have gangs in the basement that meet, you know? And so we got really excited about it. <laughs> so out came, a whole bunch of people started joining that very conversation, and out came this idea of a smile card. So the idea is that you go out and do something small for someone else. It's a small act of kindness, but it's anonymous, so they don't know who did this, so they can't say thank you back. But you leave a smile card behind which tells them that keep the chain going, pay it forward, do something nice for someone else. Maybe you pay toll for the car behind you. Maybe you mow your neighbor's lawn. Maybe you leave flowers at someone's doorstep. It doesn't matter what it is, but each act then is like a potential ripple that goes on and on, and the smile card becomes a reminder of it. So lots of people got very excited about it. And we put up a little website where people could share stories and they could request these cards. And initially, some people were kind of skeptical. They were like, ah, cute idea, nice. You know, it's not really going to change the world, but it's a nice thing to do. But then, bit by bit, people started transforming their perspective on these small acts. I remember a woman, she was doing her PhD at UC Berkeley. She was in that category of being skeptical about it. One day, she had to run an errand. So she gets in her car, goes, she's in a rush, so she kind of parks quickly, goes inside, gets what she needs from the store, comes back. Except that when she comes back, there's a little note on her card, on her car windshield. The note is cu cursing her out, saying, people like you don't belong on the streets. And it's just going on and on and on and really mean. And she looked at it and it's like, what's wrong? turned out that she had hastily parked in between two spots, and there were no other parking spots. So this person is livid, and he lets her have it. So like any rational person, she looks at it and says, OK, my fault, I understand, but this person didn't have to be so mean. But what the heck, it's an anonymous note. It doesn't really matter. Threw it away. Except that she goes home a couple hours later, and she's still thinking about how violated she feels. She's feeling hurt. A few more hours later, into the evening, she's still She's still feeling those pangs of pain inside her heart. And then it occurs to her, she says, this is exactly like the smile card, except the opposite. It leaves me feeling terrible, whereas a smile card, you make someone's day, makes them feel good, and maybe 12 hours later, they're still feeling good. All of a sudden, it clicked. So we had a website where people could order these cards and read these stories. It was a very simple website. This is a snapshot of all the different orders over a six-month period in those early days. And this is just the US. It wasn't even the most popular country. There were so many other countries it was going out to. So initially, we said, hey, look, if anybody wants these smile cards, we didn't want to be commercial. We said we would just send it to them, and we would. And then after a while, hundreds of orders came in, and then it went to thousands. And we were just doing it as like, you know, the from address on our envelope read, One Compassion Way, Mother Earth until the post office came to us and said, uh, excuse me, there is, no post off there is no one compassion way on Mother Earth. <laughs> we said, exactly the problem. Um, so we were just doing it this way, and then when thousands of uh, these requests for smile cards came in, what, could we, what would we do? Well, we could get a warehouse, fundraise, get staff. But we said, let's try something different. Put up a little note on our website. It says, is anybody, anybody up for shipping 10 orders a week? And lots of people raised their hands, and they would cover the shipping costs. So quite literally, someone in Maine orders something, and they're getting, you know, someone in California could be shipping it to them. Someone in, in Washington reads a story, says, I want cards, and someone in Mississippi could be shipping it to them. So like that, what we were doing was really just holding space. It became a platform for these many-to-many -many connections. 
Right? For many people to read each other's stories, be inspired, for many people to request, request cards and ship to each other, and it was just this cocoon of goodness. This is what we call Gandhi 3.0, this idea of a many-to-many -many network. Gandhi 1.0, of course, is Gandhi himself. <laughs> One of him, many of us. It's a one-to-many model. We are all familiar with that. But when Gandhi passed, passed away in India, there's another man who came on. This is Vinoba Bhave. Vinoba said, we need a deeper movement, so let's have a one-to-one -one movement. And he did something very inspiring. He decided to go walk from village to village. And in every village, he would go to the rich landowners and say, look, this guy is your brother. He's landless. Why don't you just give your land to him? Sounds like a crazy idea, but people would do it. So he walked tens of thousands of miles. Millions of acres of land were transferred in this way, purely on the basis of generosity. It's an unprecedented feat in human history. And he did this through one-to-one. -one. But what both Gandhi and Vinoba foreshadowed was a third way of being, which is this 3.0 idea, which is something we see in nature all the time, which is around a many-to-many -many network. This is a quote in the words of Vinoba himself. He says, to progress, society doesn't need leaders anymore. This doesn't mean that we won't have great men amidst us. I think great men will come, and they'll be vital for the progress of humanity, but they will be so great that they will refuse to take up this position of leadership. It's a very interesting idea. It sounds like, wow, why would somebody refuse to take up the position of leadership? But it's because he was talking about this many-to-many -many kind of a network. And we see this in nature all the time. Right? When, when a flock of geese are flying, the person, the geese, you know, the geese up front are rotating with those in the back, right? There's no one static leader. You look at ants and how they create anthills. Their work is distributed across thousands of these little worker ants. You see this with butterflies, you see this with bees, you see this with trees, you see this with plant ecosystems. It's everywhere in nature. But with human organizing, it was a little bit more complicated. So if you run a nonprofit organization and you're trying to deliver value, the good book says, you know, if you're a good nonprofit organization, about 20% overhead. Sounds fair. Except the internet came along and dropped that down from 20% to practically zero. So that's when all kinds of things change, and we were able to create many-to-many -many networks around human organizing. There's a lot of math behind this, also, for those that I can. Oh, wow, you guys are seem like a math crowd. Great. <laughs> As you can see in the bottom, that's the one-to-many connection, the red line. This was known as Sarnoff's Law. Sarnoff, George Sarnoff, founder of RCA. He was broadcasting content over TV. So he said, if I have an audience of 100, I have 100 connections. Makes a lot of sense. Then he moved to the one-to-one -one connection. And this was in the time of telephones and fax machines, where you could have people talking to each other, one-to-one. -one. And so that was Metcalf's law. And Metcalf says, if you have a network of 100, the number of connections is 4,950. And then came the green line. And the green line was in the time of the internet, where you could not only just connect one to one, but you could create mini groups. And so the number of unique connections in that kind of a network was known as Reed's law. And that was just ginormous. That was, one, that was greater than one with 31 zeros after it. Of course, human beings don't have capa more capacity than you. Know, I think the Dunbar number says 150 connections is the maximum capacity that human beings have for the number of relations that we can handle. But nonetheless, the value of a network can be incredibly high in a group forming network. So more visually, it looks like this. This is the hub and spoke model of Gandhi 1.0. This is the one point, this is the 2.0 model of a one-to-one -one kind of a network. And this is what a practical 3.0 many-to-many network looks like. You just have so many clusters, and clearly 3.0 is so much stronger. But why Gandhi? It's kind of a curious question. This just could be organizing 3.0. Why Gandhi 3.0? And to explore that question, I really want to look at three spheres of influence that Gandhi talked about. And Gandhi's work embodied. The first is awareness. Gandhi raised awareness about a lot of issues. This is really primarily dealing with the head. It's information. If I'm a smoker and you show me what happens to an x-ray of my lungs and says, this is what happens to your lungs when you smoke, that's helpful. That's really helpful. But it's not enough. It doesn't get me to stop smoking. So you have impact, which is the second big circle. 
And the impact says, look, your body's addicted to nicotine. Here's a little patch. It'll help you wean off of your smoking habit. And I stopped smoking. And where awareness is about the head, impact is about the hand. It's concrete. It's tangible. It's measurable. But the greatness of Gandhi and other leaders like him was that it didn't just stop there. He went to the third, he went to the third circle, which was transformation. And transformation says it's not just enough that you stop smoking, because then from smoking you might go to alcohol, you might go to chocolate. <laughs> I hear you. Um, but how do you get rid of the pattern of addiction altogether? That's a much harder problem. That requires some inner transformation. And for Gandhi, this inner transformation was of paramount importance. February 4th, 1922, India's independence movement. There was, a, it, there was a lot of momentum. There was a small town named Chori Chori. There was a peaceful protest going on. Encountered the police. Police tried to stop them. Things got a little out of hand. People got angry. Police started firing shots. And the mob just decided to attack the police. Not only did they attack the police, they chased them back to the police station and they burned the police station down. 22 people died. Gandhi looked at this. At what seemed like the peak of the independence movement, which he really cared for, Gandhi looked at this and he, and he says, our country is not ready for independence. If we're going to do that, not ready. He halted his whole movement across the country. Instead of saying, look, I just want independence, he says, I don't just want independence. I want the transformation in the hearts of the people on the other side, on this side, on every side, including me. That's what Gandhi was about. He cared for that inner transformation. And it took 25 years after that episode to finally get independence in 1947. But Gandhi cared about this. And it wasn't just Gandhi. So many leaders, Mother Teresa, Aung San Suu Kyi, Cesar Chavez, Martin Luther King, Dalai Lama, the list can go on. What they did is they worked at the intersection of awareness, impact, and transformation. They worked at the sweet spot in between. But what they couldn't do, what they, what they during their time, what they had to do was work in a 1.0 model with a hub and spoke model. Them at the center and so many people at the edges. Some of them had an option of a one-to-one -one model. But now, what we today, in today's time, what we have the opportunity to do is create a 3.0 model. And this is incredibly powerful. But of course, it requires a lot of mental shifts. I mean, really, I think of it as bridging the internet with the internet, right? Thank you, Kung Fu Panda. <laughs> it requires a lot of different shifts. Uh, and the biggest one, it starts with this. It's no longer about a Superman coming in saving the day. It really starts to look a lot more like heroes. Ha, click. <laughs> Where you have many of us tapping into the gifts that we have and working together to create new capacity to tackle the problems of our time. So some of the shifts, I think, are important to understand because they're counterintuitive in so many ways. Leadership now starts to look like laddership, where you nurture other people's journeys. Plan and execute, which they are really good at teaching in business schools, now turns into search and amplify. Because it's no longer about the manufacturing metaphor, it's more like the gardening metaphor when you're working with networks. Power shifts from the center to the edges. Big Institutions, hierarchical institutions, give way to distributed, decentralized units of operation. And these start and stop campaigns that happen all the time now, now turn into movements, ongoing movements without an exit strategy. But the Gandhi part of this Gandhi 3.0 raises one very unique question, which is this. What about the quality of the connections? It's not just about the quantity of the connections and the breadth of those connections, but what about the depth? What about the quality of the connections? And that's what Gandhi cared about and other leaders like him talked about. This is Henry David Thoreau. He puts it really comically, 1854. He says, look, we're in a great haste to construct a magnetic telegraph from Maine to Texas, but Maine and Texas, it may be, have nothing important to communicate. So we have all these connections, but how deep is the bond? What is the substance that is being communicated over those connections? That makes, makes a huge difference. We've done this. We've used this for profit. We've seen it work. We've used this for protest. Some dramatic change has occurred in, in recent times, in the last five years that we've seen because of the power of this kind of organizing. But we haven't seen enough 
for love. And the reason why love is so significant is because of the quality of the ties. When you go from profit to protest to love, you go from loose ties to deep ties to very rich, noble ties. And those noble ties end up making a very significant difference because with those noble ties, you start connecting the branch tips to the roots. This is a photo of a woman post-Hurricane Katrina walking down the street that she grew up in. Hurricane Katrina destroyed, pummeled everything along, on, this, on this street and so many other streets. But they couldn't destroy one thing, oak trees. Oak trees like this survived. And the reason why they survived is because they had deep roots. And it wasn't just that they had deep roots. Their deep roots were connected to the deep roots of other oak trees and sometimes spanning over 100 miles. And so whenever one oak tree is in trouble, the other oak tree starts giving in. And if that other oak tree needs a little bit more backup, that third oak tree comes in and there's this whole network of oak trees. And together they create an incredibly resilient ecosystem. And this is really our potential as we start going deeper. We've all experienced this in small ways. Even if we're unconscious, we've experienced it. I remember I was in college. One time I got out of lab at like 3 a.m. I was just like, Mom, you didn't hear the story. So I, I get out of lab and I said, you know, I just want to go running. So I decided to go for a run. On my way back, I'm warming down and I'm just heading to my apartment. All of a sudden, I find myself in a dark alley. No one's in the dark alley, but I see, an, I see a menacing looking man out in the front. It looks like he's got a concealed weapon. And I'm thinking, okay, I've never been mugged in my life. It's going to happen now. <laughs> and I freak out. You know, it's, it's like when you're in grade school and your teacher's asking you a question and you're just, you don't know the answer. You're like avoiding eye contact, you know? That's kind of what happened to me. I'm like avoiding eye contact. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm like, man, if I run, he, there's no way I'm going to get caught. I don't know what to do, but I'm still inching forward, inching forward. And then I had this one radical thought. What if this guy is my brother? Why, what am I afraid of? What am I keeping with me? If he was my brother, before he could even ask, I would just give it to him. Here, brother, this is for you. And that thought was so radical. I felt huge. I felt deep in that very moment. And instead of looking down and looking away and being fearful, I looked straight at him. And as I passed him, I smiled. And he looks back at me, eye to eye, and he smiles back. And maybe nothing was going to happen that day. I don't know, but what I do know is how I felt. I know that I tapped into the depth of my connection, and as I tapped into my roots, I knew somewhere that my roots were connected to his roots. And so, the today, so today, the possibility that I want to leave you with is this idea of Gandhi 3.0. 3.0 is, is brought to us by information technology. It's a kind of IT that gives us the possibility of the breadth of connections. But there's a different kind of IT, which is inner transformation, which allows us to go to the depth of these connections. And when we do this, we have not only the power of many, we also have the power of one. And together, we can do the work of love. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.